Okay, so last two episodes we start off with Venetian Crete, partly because that's where our story with all of this began, partly I think it just makes a good case as to why to get excited about all of this. But now we had to figure out in what order to do the rest. Now, let me save you the trouble. If you wanted to try and do it chronologically by the order that Venice controlled its territories, I mean, not only do you need a pint of espresso to go near that, it's just one of the least useful lenses to understand the Venetian Republic. They would control a place or region, lose it, get it back again, lose it again, and even defining what control means. There's this whole mix of soft power, hard power, different approaches and systems of government. In fact, their whole thing was having a mercantile empire, and if it was advantageous to control a region, they would. But also, they were fairly happy in a lot of cases just to have a friendly quarter of a port town where they could stay and do business. You know, above all, personally, my chief gripe when it comes to the history of the Venetian Republic Everyone wants to write pages and pages on the city of Venice. Lots of shots of Carnivale masks. Yes, yes, all fine. But the rest of the Republic's holdings are mostly shunted off to the footnotes. Why? Don't you want to see what's happening in all these places? I mean, look at all of this. I mean, Venice the city is great, but Venice had a huge influence on the history of Croatia, Montenegro, Greece, and Cyprus. On the coastlines of all of these, you can scarcely get away from everything they left behind, and of course, not forgetting parts of Albania, Slovenia, and of course, Italy. I mean, heavens forfend, we try and spend some time in these gorgeous, sun-drenched coastlines and find out about the culture that shaped history here for 500 plus years. Ah, come on guys, nothing to see here, I wouldn't bother. Well, ugh, if all of you won't, then we will. But before we can jump into that, last episode served as a good teaser for the sort of things we're going to come across this season. And we've promised you all a good few long form episodes specifically as an add on to this series so that all of you who are interested can dig into the historical details a little bit more. So all well and good, but it's the standard thing. I'm in too deep with this and I forget that a lot of the things we're discussing or casually name checking are completely unknown to a lot of people, most people probably. That's how it was for us when we first saw Crete. We had no idea about the Venetian Republic. You know, in the UK, we have a fairly Anglo-centric perspective on history, prioritizing what is close and most directly affects us, and things a little further away, like the Persian Empire, or maybe the Byzantine Empire, or even just the Kingdom of Hungary. These don't get picked up in our school system, and the odds of finding anyone who isn't a history enthusiast having much knowledge of these are slim. It's been a challenge of this series to pick a map to go with, I know that might seem strange. I mean, how much difference can there be in a map of Europe? Well, Venetian control varied considerably over time. Take, for example, the Peloponnese. If you make a map that highlights Venetian dominions, that stands out as one of the most noticeable chunks. But in fact, this is quite specific to a 30-year period between around 1686 and 1715. Previous to that, they'd had some control around the coasts, for example, Caroni and Methoni, on the southwestern extremity just down here. But for most of the Republic's history, this was a largely Byzantine domain fought over by Frankish lords post Fourth Crusade and then eaten up by the Ottomans not long after 1453. With, of course, a flood of asterisks and yes, 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 not getting into the details right here. So it's one thing to show all the places the Venetians ever controlled, but you have to caveat it with dates. Uh, some of these were in Venetian hands for less than a generation. Some, like Thessaloniki, were under Venetian control barely long enough to boil the kettle. Mm, but counterpoint. For a while there, they had hoovered up the greater percentage of the eastern Mediterranean coasts and islands. I mean, admit it, this is worth knowing about, not least as it's largely unknown to many, and there is an embarrassment of riches, of lovely Venetian architecture running all the way through. So with all of that in mind, we really can't go any further without giving you a short history of the Venetian Republic. I hate having to do these. Anytime there's a short summary, you have to oversimplify, editorialize, and just leave a bunch of stuff unsaid. But it's just not gonna work if people aren't caught up on the rough story of how all of this came about. So, deep breath, start the clock. Venice gets founded essentially by Roman refugees, uh, citizens fleeing what was becoming a familiar pattern of destruction and sacking in northern Italy. Places like Aquileia, home to 100,000 people at its height, were repeatedly attacked and burnt by various armies, including that of Attila the Hun, and eventually left in ruins. This was happening all through the flats of northern Italy and the Po Valley. 
Hard to believe even Rome was practically emptied of people. Parts like the Forum ended up used for simple farming and even later reverting to a malarial swamp. The lagoons that form at the northernmost extent of the Adriatic Sea were hard places to try and scratch a living, but the water would prove a sufficient deterrence against the armies that came past in late antiquity. So yes, by comparison, Venice was doing pretty great for itself, and its amphibious origins created a seafaring and fishing culture which was keen to be trading further afield. And with the blessing of the Eastern Roman, or Byzantine, Empire, who were only too happy to have a strong subject in an area where they'd lost effective control, the Venetians grew in wealth and influence. Skipping over a lot, the trend over the thousand years was that the Byzantines were a long, slow decline. Spoiler alert. Spoilers from history. But come on, it's practically Taylor's old as time at this stage. And the Byzantines' loss would often turn into Venice's gain, although it would take a while. In the early Middle Ages, one of the most pressing needs in the Adriatic Sea was the ability to counter piracy in the region. And Venice, with mixed success at first, ended up taking on the role of policing the seas that they were dependent on for so much of their profit. These demonstrations of strength over time morphed into something resembling a protection racket, at least as far as the cities of the eastern coast of the Adriatic were concerned. These scattered coastal towns amongst the myriad of islands and mountainous coasts on what is now Croatia rather chafed under this increasing Venetian hegemony, and so Venetian control wavered back and forth. I mean, at one point a lot later, with the Treaty of Zara in 1358, Venice had to cede all of its Dalmatian holdings to Hungary, though they clawed them back over time. Meanwhile, through the Middle Ages, Venice itself was going from strength to strength, helped by both its role in the First Crusade supporting Western powers, but also subsequent trade with Islamic powers, something the other Christian states were noticeably squeamish in doing. They had a lengthy rivalry going with Genoa, pretty much their opposite from the other side of the Italian boot. Venice would come out on top and Genoa diminish, but not before a couple of very close calls where Venice was on the brink of destruction. Meanwhile, Fourth Crusade, the Venetians are the chief architects behind a spectacularly bloody and destructive sacking of Constantinople, hobbling the Byzantines who, despite making a quite remarkable comeback over the following 100 years, never fully recovered, and with increasing influence in Anatolia, the Ottomans started gobbling up chunks of former Byzantine territories in the Balkans at a rapid pace. Venice was also getting more of a property portfolio, more permanently than before with control of Crete, but not without massive numbers of local uprisings, um, Corfu and the Ionian Islands, and the Cyclades, but again, not without a fair amount of chaos and corruption from the local lords that had possession of them. And finally, almost all of the eastern side of the Adriatic. Pretty soon, Dubrovnik was amongst a handful of the coastal areas along this stretch of which Venice could claim no control. Though as you got further down, most of Albania would end up Ottoman, and likewise Epirus and the western mainland coast of Greece. The Ottomans would ensure that this upward trajectory of Venetian expansion would not continue, and soon the two sides would come to blows over and over again for different parts of the Mediterranean. Though perhaps surprisingly, often retaining trade relations throughout these conflicts, or at the very least, returning to the status quo of business shortly after. Yet trade and business meant that much to Venice that, baffling though it may seem, time and time again, they could be in opposition, even all-out war with someone, whilst also continuing to trade with them, as if nothing were amiss. Now, despite the Ottomans gradually eating away at Venetian holdings, there was still more to come. The Venetian control of Cyprus was a huge step, although full control was for just a little over 80 years. On the Italian mainland, Venice had been gradually increasing its territory, but this would culminate in a series of conflicts with the other Italian city-states and European powers, the details of which are so twisting and complex they make Hieronymus Bosch look like a minimalist. In the 1600s, the eventual loss of Crete to the Ottomans after the 21-year siege of Candia was a huge blow. The end of the 1600s began to look like a reversal of fortunes, with Venice controlling the entire Peloponnese, but 30 years later, this was all undone. And by the 1700s, while the Ottomans weren't the explosive dynamic force they had been before, Venice was also not the power it had once been. Its possessions largely limited to the Adriatic, from the Ionian Islands up the Dalmatian coast and to the lagoon itself. 
The status quo remained pretty much unchanged for the rest of the century, until in a spectacular anticlimax in 1797, with little standing army to defend itself over land, Venice was in the crosshairs of Napoleon, who had torn through northern Italy with seeming ease. Venice tried to talk its way out of the problem, but in an extremely disappointing season finale, and if we can just have the biggest spoiler alert, History. Napoleon declared the Republic dissolved. That was the end of it. No more Venetian Republic after 1797. Definitely a case of the writers losing interest before the finale. But final score, a Republic that stood for a thousand years with startling stability when compared to the histrionics that racked politics in almost every other province of Italy, a devastatingly effective economy with innovations like production line shipbuilding that were centuries ahead of the rest of Europe, and a culture that was a byword of class and good taste. Okay, stop the clock. So if none of that serves as a justification, I honestly don't know what to tell you. But with that, I think we should get back on trail. As you already know from the title and thumbnail, we are starting at the top of the Adriatic. Venice itself we will circle back to last. But to begin, the third Venetian town we ever visited all the way back in 2018, Pula and the Istrian Peninsula. We already have ample amounts to say about Pula, and we have done in our travel episode, link in the top right. Pula is justifiably best known for having this are you kidding me amphitheater. It's just exquisitely pretty. And yes, Pula wears its Roman influence on its sleeve all around the town with temples and arches and all sorts. This makes it all the more puzzling that the history of the town reads like a series of gut punches. For a city with an amphitheater surviving so well, it sure has been wrecked a bunch of times, including getting sacked by the Venetians themselves in 1243 as a retribution for their brief alliance with Pisa. I mean, just look at this list of destruction events. Somehow, between all of them, they were at least polite enough not to tear down the amphitheatre or the Temple of Augustus or the Arch of the Sergi. It's frankly a near miracle. But that's not to say the city itself was doing great. I mean, by the 1700s, the city had declined to fewer than 3,000 occupants, and it really only exploded to its current size and prominence under the Austro Hungarians, for whom it was a major port and naval base. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Beginning at the high point of the town, this is the Venetian fort. It's been used as a handy acropolis since way back in antiquity. I mean, attesting to this, on the eastern slopes there's a small Roman theatre. When I first saw this, it was, uh, well, some modest ruins. Now it's been augmented in some mm, less than beautiful ways. The fort itself is a mildly unusual one. It has some Austro-Hungarian upgrades, such as the lighthouse. Okay, sure. It might not look that different at first to a lot of the other forts we're going to be looking at, with various protrusions and, uh, to use a technical term, pointy bits. However, if you look at a floor plan, this is quite a different profile to what we're used to. This was thanks to its design by French military engineer Anton de Ville, construction beginning in 1630. It's quite compact, and this level of symmetry in almost all directions is unusual. Venetian forts are often highly irregular, a round bastion here, some angular bastions there, often just catering to whatever the terrain requires, very much function over form. Now, in trying to frame out a lot of the modern bits, it actually gives you comparatively few angles to shoot the fort. Um, short supercut? Yeah, let's have a short supercut. Then descending down into the town, the next and most prominent Venetian structure is the Logia and the town square. This is a gorgeous place to spend time. It's hard to resist sitting with an espresso and a book when the view is well, this. Now, I love this, I really do, but it hurts just a little that it occupies the footprint of a former Roman temple. Not that one, there used to be a trio of temples here. and. Considering how well the Temple of Augustus has survived, the thought that the larger Temple of Diana could have made it too? Yeah, the original temple had been used as the town hall, but then towards the end of the 1200s, it was decided that a new town hall was needed. Partial credit to the builders, they did incorporate elements of the old building into the new. For example, these elements on the western side are from the original temple. The current structure is a mixture of the work completed in 1296, an upgrade in the 1400s, and then another in the 1600s. 
The square itself, what was formerly the Roman Forum, also has some beautiful Venetian traces scattered around, though in all likelihood restored. Also, to my discredit, I didn't give the cathedral a proper go over. I had wrongly inferred from its architecture this was much more recent than it actually is. I mean, the Campanile is from 1707, hence pretty recent, but the church had to be largely rebuilt in the 1400s. You can see some traces of earlier structures recycled into the wall. I constantly bump up against my past self, who was nowhere near as picky about details or church crawling in general. So when I circle back to cut these episodes together, I rarely have all of the details I'd like to show. In fact, other than flashing up some brief shots of other churches, I don't have much to show of all the church crawling stuff around Pula. It's not helped that several of these are continually locked or rarely open to the public. Uh, for the most part, Pula either needs crediting to later, when the Austro-Hungarians added just a flurry of forts in varying sizes, or earlier, with Byzantine or medieval layers from somewhat before the Venetians got established here. So, while this feels incomplete, a lot of Venetian Pula was built around the traces of the past. So, the Roman wall, which they propped up and augmented, sure, but that's in pretty similar form to antiquity, or older buildings like this, the Church of St. Mary Formosa, surviving from the 500s onwards. So, that's about all we've got. Time to move along. Nearby, the Brioni Islands have similarly retained some treasures from the Byzantine slash Exarchate of Ravenna era and some 20th century Yugoslav stuff, but while it might not leap out, right by the main harbour is a fortified tower from the Venetian period. Though it's been so neatly restored, it's not surprising that disagreements abound on its construction date, ranging anywhere from the 12 to the 1500s. And opposite that, the Church of St. Germain, again noticeably updated with much more recent work, but there's some nice gladiotic inscriptions on display inside. Okay, heading further north, we don't have to go far at all before arriving at a treasure trove of Venetian structures. Now, considering the town is quite small and not perched on the coast like most of the other major towns, Vodjan is quite a surprise standout um, to cut in a moment. We have an unusual resource for all of this. Uh, years ago, I discovered this website run for the Istrian Tourism Board. Now, where websites like this are often very surface level and poorly sourced, like a couple of sentences on a historic site, and you know, the page mainly existing for ad space and promoting a few sponsored accommodations. Whoever put this together has put so much more love and detail into it than they needed to. I mean, they comb out all the small, obscure sites from tiny churches to Venetian palaces. And for a change, it means we actually have some detail on these individual buildings, the likes of which are usually hard to turn up in English, at least. Um, I don't know if the designers were from Vodjan, but proportional to its size, it gets way more play than other locations on the site. As I walked into the town from the east, there's a long straight main street which, to my UK eyes, is both picturesque and shabby at the same time. You know, shuttered windows showing corrosion, somewhat battered doors, but also a lot of cement. Um, eventually, you get to this rather beautiful, though very quiet, square with gorgeous buildings. There's the Batika Palace. Um, just a heads up, the word palace is going to get an increasing amount of play, which is just a little confusing. These aren't palaces like you might be picturing. They're basically above average nice houses. I'm afraid I don't have views from inside these, but yes, it's nice we've got a fair amount of Venetian domestic architecture surviving. So yes, the Batika Palace, uh, the structure dating from as early as the 1300s, but coming into the hands of the wealthy Batika family in the 1500s. Definitely some nice Venetian Gothic on display here. And opposite that, the Benussi House. While this isn't visible now, when it was renovated in the 1800s, an inscription was discovered in the Istrian dialect that reads, thank you for asking, I am fine. Um, which is cute. <laughs> the humor might carry better in its original language. Uh, and not to gloss over this, yes, there is a native Istrian language, distinct from the Venetian-Italian, of course, Croat. Though it's only spoken in a clutch of specific towns, including Ravine, Kanfanar, and three others I don't have footage for here, and in Vodjan. It apparently still has around 400 speakers, which, while not really enough to ensure its survival, uh, still more than you might expect. A short way round the corner, and at the heart of the town, this is the Church of St. Blaise. It's late in the game as far as the Venetian Republic is concerned, built in 1760 and not fully finished till around 1800. While it apparently has the relics of St. Blaise, a quick search reveals that enough churches around the world claim to have those to reconstruct pretty much an entire ice hockey team out of all the bones and paraphernalia. 
Heading back, the Porterole Palace has been restored, though it's believed it was originally a Venetian-era building. And after all that, perhaps the single most notable building in the town, I actually have struggled to pull up any information other than it's the town council building. Other than being rather attractive and certainly not short on striking colour, it also appears to be more of a modern facsimile of the rest of the town's Venetian architecture. So, yeah, that's probably more detail than you'd expect from a pretty small town. Now next, we're heading to Ravine, and we've got further to see up the coast, but I'm trying to get into the discipline of not overloading these episodes, and since we needed the front half of this to give you an overview of the Republic, we'll break off the next few Istrian towns into another episode. But not done just yet, it's Lion Watch, the part of the episode where we gawk at the bafflingly low quality attempts the Venetians made to draw their own logo, and, oh, embarrassingly, while we've got a whole clutch coming next episode, there's a shortage this time. Looks like the Austro-Hungarians de-lioned the Pula Fort. Uh, if there was one in this space, that's the normal place for them. By the way, inside the Roman Temple of Augustus, there's a sculpture of a lion from the 100s AD, proving that while lions might not be easy to carve, they're still definitely doable. And uh, this is a good 1,200 years before the Venetian examples we're seeing. I did have one, which I found, and this is a bit embarrassing. I've lost where in Pula it's from. It's got the look of a spaniel in a Halloween costume, and it's tucked on a door lintel, but while I normally can just recall the layout of where things are in a town, this one escapes me, and uh, while I took the close-up, I didn't get a wide. So it may be near this church, I'm not sure. Okay, well this keeps happening. After recording the voiceover weeks ago and scrubbing through clips, we had to insert here with one more we found. This is displayed inside the church of St. Germain on Brioni. It's from the 1400s and my goodness does it have some strong primary school energy. An early edition on a list that will have many entries that appear to have been outsourced to sculptors that have not yet reached the age of 10. Right, additional edition. No, really, we are actually doing this just got done editing the next episode and it's not only too long but also overflowing with a great many lines so we're going to go ahead and put some more here in ravine which we've not made it to yet there are two prominent examples in the square rather than magisterial there's something rather vampiric about this one on the Khalifi palace and maybe from corrosion but got a bit of a pig snout going on there the balby gate by contrast uh, the top jaw and face is actually not a bad attempt if a little stylized which is why i am calling restoration that portion is just too neat and clean and not at all weathered i'm saying probably the last 40 years tops there's also this small one on the council hall with paws too small for its body, let alone handling a book, and derping rather hard. I only managed to spot one in Porech, it's high up on the pentagonal tower, and yes, okay, attempts have been made? As is pretty much always the case, the body is not too bad, it's the face where it falls apart. With oversized eyes and a glum drooping mouth, it kind of has the appearance not dissimilar to a trout. Anyway, that's it, we really are done this time. More and better lions next time, and by better I mean far worse. If you've been enjoying the music in the background, it's ours, we create all the music for these episodes, and you can find them on bandcamp.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Please find us on all the socials and follow us there, otherwise we'll catch you pretty soon. Thank you.